Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the No Holds Bar. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we are an MMA history podcast. We've also got some of the old school jujitsu guys, but we've never really gotten to the newer jujitsu practitioners. And this guy, I, I don't think there's anybody in the entire United States that has a better resume than yourself. Rafael Lovato, man, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate you saying newer jujitsu guy because... Um, you know, I've been around a while, so I'll take those those younger compliments. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the older guys that we've had on, man, crusty. You know, they've been around a couple blocks, so you're definitely new as compared to them. So anyway, Raphael, let's talk about yourself. I mean, we'll do, obviously, there's a lot out there about you, but why don't you talk about your beginnings, especially the influence of your father, so people can kind of get to know who you are. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been doing martial arts my whole life. Um, a lot of people know me as as just a jiu-jitsu guy, but I had uh, martial arts in my life well before um, jiu-jitsu ever came into it. Uh, my father uh, is a JKD instructor, Jeet Kune Do instructor, and he was um, an assistant instructor at the um, JKD school um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I was born. And when I was eight years old, we moved to Oklahoma and, uh, and then he opened his own school here. And um, he spent a lot of time with, with Richard Bastillo and Danny and Osano, some of the greatest martial artists that have ever walked the earth. And uh, I got to learn from them when I was a kid. Um, but the, the, the major part of my training was just under my father directly doing Jeet Kune Do and also boxing. My dad was a, a boxer growing up um, in Chicago and uh, Richard Bastillo was also a very good boxer and they shared that in common. And uh, so I did a lot of boxing um, growing up. And then I played around with, you know, stick fighting, um, uh, you know, the Wing Chun, like all of it, um, you know, Muay Thai, Savat, uh, we did, we did everything. And then Jiu Jitsu came into our lives. Um, or like we had just heard about Jiu Jitsu right when the first UFC started. And so I remember my dad telling me like, Hoist is going to win, uh, you know, no doubt about it. They have no idea what's coming. Hoist is going to win. Hoist is going to win. And we watched it and it was just like, wow, you know, and, uh, and then he dedicated himself to learning jujitsu. Um, he was traveling from here in Oklahoma all the way to California to study under the Gracies that eventually became the Machado brothers. And then Carlos Machado moved to Dallas, Texas to um, teach Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris was a student of the Machado brothers in LA. And then when Chuck got signed to do the Walker Texas Ranger show, he brought Carlos with him to Texas, Dallas, Texas. And that changed our lives because then we had a, a, a high level, you know, black belt within driving distance, you know, just uh, three, three and a half hours away. And that's when I would say that my jujitsu training really started because before that, um, it, my dad was only learning a couple of times a year when he could get to California and he would show me, would watch tapes. You know, we were trying to study, but it was like really, really hard. And then uh, Carlos moved to Dallas at the end of 95. Um, and I took my first lesson with Carlos in 96. Um, I was like 12, almost 13 years old. And, um, and then my legend. dad. Yeah. Legend. Yeah. What's crazy. What's funny about that is like Bruce Lee was instrumental in inspiring my dad to become a martial artist. And then Chuck Norris was the reason why we ended up with jujitsu, um, you know, in this area of the country. And so Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris were like, you know, yeah. they, they changed, they changed our lives. Um, and, and that was it. Long story short, my father, uh, he got his black belt a year before I did. We became the first American father and son jujitsu black belts. And uh, the first ones to bring jujitsu to Oklahoma, you know, we never had a black belt here in our state. We, we always traveled. And the first time I went to Brazil, I was just 16 years old, 1999. And, uh, and that's it, man. It's just been a long, a long, hard, but very beautiful road and beautiful journey um, that I'm very grateful for. Well, you had mentioned Dan Inosanto. 
Did you ever take those trips to work out with Dan? Yes. Yes, I did. Um, I actually went to uh, the IMB Academy in California and trained there before. I'd, I would be like the little kid, um, you know, either on the side or actually in the class at, at some of uh, Dan's seminars that, that my dad would go to. Um, yeah, I was around him a lot. I have a couple pictures with, uh, with Dan whenever I was just like probably, you know, seven, eight years old. Um, you know, just a little kid being around, you know, one of the greatest martial artists ever. Ever. So I'm assuming Eric Paulson was in that room with your father a few times as well. Um, I know they crossed paths. Um, I, I've crossed paths with Eric before too. And he, and he knew, uh, like he remembered my father from, from back in those old days. I don't remember Eric whenever I was a kid being around him. Um, but, uh, but I know that we were in very, you know, close in the same circle, same with Josh Barnett. Um, you know, like J Josh remembers my dad from years ago as well. Um, so yeah, yeah. Small world. <laughs> So you, for, for those of you at home, in Osanta, we had Eric Paulson on, and Eric was doing private lessons with Hickson and Hoist in like the mid-80s. So way before even UFC 1 even took place, and he also was doing private lessons with Inosanto. So the question is, who influenced you the most out of those three top-tier martial artists? He said Inosanto. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me. Um, I think with someone like that, you're not just getting the techniques or the, the martial arts themselves. You're getting access to a very special mind, you know, um, a, a, a vision. And, um, and, you know, especially with the age that he's at and, and the life that he's lived, there's just so much wisdom and inspiration to gain from that. Um, it doesn't surprise me. And I got to say that Richard Bastillo, Although he's not as well as well known as Danny, um, he's also a very special martial artist. And my father and him were were extra close. Um, uh, he spent a little more time with Richard than what he did with Danny, and um, and Richard had a big impact um, on my father and also myself. And he was very much the same. You know, Richard also trained jujitsu. Uh, you know, did it all and had a very special mind. I mean, these are the two uh, top students of Bruce Lee. You know, so. Uh, we're talking about like just, you know, crazy legacy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think they get enough credit in my opinion. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. So just so everybody at home kind of understands, dude, obviously jujitsu wizard, former Bellator world champion, but your journey in mixed martial arts actually that I can see starts in 2002. The UFC calls your family and asks you guys to help them with the legalization process within the state of Oklahoma. What was that like? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's interesting that you know that you know about that. Um, my father was uh, uh, on the panel, you know, talking with the athletic commission here, and he had a major part in um, you know getting them to legalize MMA here in Oklahoma. Um, you know, he, he had aspirations of uh, starting his own promotion and um, and you know, um, doing his, like a, a, a new business venture and, uh, it never fully got off the ground. It kind of came back years later and, and, and he did a little bit with it, but, um, um, you know, he told, he was telling me about it. I didn't even really fully understand it. Um, you know, like I was just, I was so young, uh, back then and, uh, and I, I was, completely, I mean, I loved martial arts my whole life. I really did, but <laughs> But jujitsu was different. It was um, it was a, a different sort of passion that I had for jujitsu. You know, keep in mind I was a kid training martial arts that was mainly striking arts, and the little bit of grappling that we did was really rough. You know, I mean, we were literally doing it on carpet. You know, on a on a concrete floor, and um, it was more like you know, uh, catch wrestling, like catches, catch can, um, you know, where like a bigger guy just clearly had the advantage, you know? And so for me being, being a, a young kid trying to roll around with adults, um, it hurt, you know? And then when jujitsu came along and I was like beginning to be a teenager, you know, 13, 14 years old, um, I was a big kid, 
you know, really, really tall, really long. And I was flexible and I immediately was able to develop a guard that um, uh, most people couldn't pass, you know, just because most people weren't that experienced or we were all learning together. And, and me and my dad were obviously uh, doing, doing more than most of those around us. And, um, and I had a, a good triangle choke uh, early on. And so as soon as I experienced being a young kid, being able to submit a grown man and, uh, and like protect myself and not get hurt. Um, you know, when I was boxing, cause I boxed, uh, on an amateur level too, all of my boxing sparring was with grown men. Like there, there just wasn't any other kids for me to train with. And, um, and you know, like getting hit by a grown man, you know, it, it hurt a little bit like as a kid, but then doing jujitsu with them and not getting hit and then actually being able to beat them, I was like, okay, this is it. So um, when we're going into those years, like 18, 19, you know, 20 and, and beyond, um, I was so focused on, uh, you know, earning my black belt and then becoming a black belt world champion. That was, that was my, my everything. So I was still doing some striking arts um, and helping my dad train the fighters that, that we had at that time. Um, but I, I didn't really have any um, any motivation to fight MMA at that time. Um, I knew I would do it at some point, but it wasn't my focus. And so, uh, you know, he he was the he was the head coach. He was training our guys. Uh, we had a little fight team back in those days, and uh, and then he had you know the 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 goal of creating a show to get his guys fights and all that stuff. And and I was really outside of that. I was just jiu-jitsu 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 so you, your father i mean obviously had a forward mindset but he also he never pumped the brakes for you because he was your kid like if you look at females in mixed martial arts at the upper echelon many will say most of my sparring is with men when you were a child you sparred with men <laughs> oh and it gets better than that um you know we had a we had a school in, in a pretty rough area. Um, <laughs> you know, we, uh, you know, there were bars on our windows. Uh, my dad used to sleep at the school a lot um, just because he was worried someone was going to break in. There was a bar, a couple, a couple of doors down. There was a bar. So there's always drunk guys around. And there was this um, like um, uh, apartment complex that was, um, known to have a lot of violence um right behind our school and uh, and anyways you know th this was a completely different time so um you know if someone ever came in and, and kind of was like challenging us or, or you know talking trash or whatever my dad would gladly invite them to come right on in and <laughs> um and put gloves on and we would get after it and by the time i was 15 um you know when someone came in and was ready to challenge my dad, something like that. He would say, well, why don't you go start over there with my son first? And, uh, you know, I would fully put on uh, little gloves and, um, and fight random people that came in. And uh, we, we would always have a lot of fun with that. And there, there would be, there would be, uh, you know, guys with experience, wrestlers that didn't know jujitsu or stand up fighters that didn't know wrestling and jujitsu, you know, that sort of thing. And, so from a very early age, I was understanding how to be a mixed martial artist, how to put together strategy, um, you know, and uh, and that's the that's the way I grew up. So, like I said, I always knew I would fight eventually. And, I'm, and a lot of people didn't know that about me when I was like really starting to make a name for myself in jiu jitsu. They had they had no idea about my background, um, but I, I really felt like I was made for MMA because of my upbringing and uh, I mean, when we first started learning jujitsu, we didn't know about a sport of jujitsu. You know, my dad was just learning jujitsu for self-defense, for combat. Um, he, he, it wasn't like, oh, I want to learn jujitsu so I can compete, so I can do a sport and win medals and titles and things like that. Um, that, that wasn't in my mind. So it was always very much like for combat, for self-defense. Um, and then later we found out, oh, there's actually tournaments, you know, in Brazil and there's a world championships and stuff like that. And, um, and then I started to have those goals because I loved, I loved competition. I like to challenge myself, but 
um, you know, it was a different upbringing. Like nowadays people come in our school and they're talking about it more as a sport than as a self-defense, like martial art. And, uh, and they're like, oh, I want to put my kid in a new sport. I've been hearing a lot about jujitsu. I know there's tournaments. This is what, what I want my kid to do. You know, for me, it wasn't like that. Wow. How important is that life lesson of getting punched in the face? <laughs> Man, it's, uh, it's not for everybody. Um, don't get me wrong. I think it, it, the, the, the bare minimum is you got to get out of your comfort zone in some shape or form. And if you train martial arts, you know, when you walk into the doors, you're already doing that, you know, for the most part, like you're starting something new and, um, and, you know, like hats off to all of those that, that take that first step. Right. But then once you, you get going, um, and let's say you're just practicing jujitsu, um, you know, at some point you're going to get comfortable again, right? Like it's not going to be the same challenge because now you know everybody, you've gotten to a certain level, you can handle yourself, you know what's going on, all that good stuff. Um, but I think it's important to understand all the different facets of jujitsu and, and, and what, you know, mixed martial arts really, really is. And so if you do gi, you need to do no gi. If you're doing gi and no gi, you need to wrestle, you know, you need to do judo and then do some striking arts, you know, and at the end of it, it's like, okay, how does my foundation of jujitsu, how does it hold up when someone can punch me, uh, when someone can hit me, you know, and uh, to be honest, like I've never had any sort of real life street altercation or, uh, or fight in my life. Um, the first fight that I ever got into was my very first professional fight. Good so for you. obviously, thank you. So obviously I've been hitting my head my whole life. So I was very aware. <laughs> I was very aware of what it feels like and what it's like to, to you know, to receive a punch. Um, but I've never been put in a situation where it was like, you know, kind of like a, uh, you know, m me or them, you know, like a do or die situation where I have to really defend myself and, um, and, and be a, in a different level of aggression. And, um, and so that was a big inspiration for me to fight MMA because I wanted to know how I could carry myself, how I would respond, um, and just flat out do something that I was scared to do, you know, and I think that's important, you know, so just to continue challenging yourself and understand that martial arts, you know, if you're a jujitsu practitioner, you are a martial artist. So uh, go beyond, you know, just learn, be a student in everything. And I promise you'll find things in other arts that will make you better at jujitsu, will make you better at your primary uh, passion, you know? There's a little bit of ego in wrestling and jujitsu about not looking at other arts. You have always seemed to kind of escape that. Like no one's ever kind of pointed at you saying, eh, you worked out here, you worked out there. Why? Like you're, you seem to have a past that many don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to just take all that back to my father and uh, you know, especially the, the Jeet Kune Do mindset. Um, I mean, we, we learned it all. I mean, he had people that he would bring that taught, uh, you know, Pinjok Silat, that taught Savat. Richard Bastille would teach a lot of boxing. He brought Vut Kamnark to teach Muay Thai when I was a little kid, you know, like he would bring the best of the best um, in different arts. And it was all very interesting to me because, you know, for me, another element of martial arts is, is movement, right? It's just moving our bodies. Um, and of course, if we're, uh, you know, if we're doing jujitsu, we're, we're very close to another body, right? So it's how our bodies um, are, you know, our strategy, our mind, our technique is, is going against another body with a different strategy and mind and, and technique. And, uh, and then you take that into striking. We're not so close, but it's still the same thing. Um, and it's all movement. And I, from a very early age, fell in love with the movement, like watching Bruce Lee in movies and stuff and videos of him when I was a kid, you know, there'd always be those moments where it would go in slow motion. Now, of course, everything looks super cool in slow motion, but something about Bruce Lee moving 
it was just like, whoa, like he's making it look beautiful. You know, he's making it look like art. And, uh, and that's what it is. It's martial arts. And so I always love to explore different forms of movement. And I take that in, in other aspects in my physical training, you know, doing yoga and, and mobility, different sorts of animal flows and movements. You know, I love to practice all of it. I like to use kettlebells, maces, you know, different things to move my body in different ways. Cause I feel like the better mover I am, the better martial artist I, I, I can be. Okay. So in 2003, obviously that's where you met Salo in, at the Gracie Arnold's. Yes. First, why don't we describe your relationship with Salo and Zanchi? Well, uh, man, it's, um, it's like family. Like it's, you know, uh, as close as you can get to a blood or even closer, you know, like I, I, it feels weird to say that because a lot of people have blood relationships, you know, and they don't even really talk to that person or, you know, they're just so different. Um, you know, it, there's something, something more powerful about the family you choose versus the family that you, you have. Yeah. 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 That, that you're forced to have. Um, and, uh, and they are 100% family. Uh, you know, Salo has always been, you know, kind of like mentor, teacher, uh, big brother, almost uncle kind of, uh, kind of a person in my life. Um, you know, when I first connected with him, he was, you know, uh, he was already a legend and he was still in some of his prime years of his career, albeit the end, but, uh, but I mean, he, uh, uh, he, he was, I mean, he was beating everyone up. <laughs> he was beating everyone up. Um, he, he was a level above all of us, uh, multiple levels above. And, uh, and, you know, he, he, he was, a uh, just a genius, uh, with his technique, his approach to mindset and strategy. Um, you know, the way he viewed, combat and he could break it break someone down and understand how to beat them um you know technically physically mentally um was second to none and he really showed me how to have an attitude of a champion i i didn't i didn't have access to you know i didn't have someone mentoring me and telling me how to how to be a champion you know like uh the the you know carlos was an incredible teacher, you know, amazing technician, uh, beautiful jujitsu mind, but he wasn't really much of a competitor. He did have his moments in competition, but nothing like solo, um, you know, six time world champion, two time ADCC champion, you know, legend, legend, legend. And, um, uh, and solo thrived. I mean, that's what he, that's who he was a competitor first and foremost in those, in those days. And, um, you know, th there's something about having that guidance of like, this is how you think, this is how you, you know, you carry yourself, you know, finding your, your swagger, your style, your attitude, your, you know, all of that. I needed, I needed someone to, to, you know, give me that guidance. Um, you know, confidence was, was always a struggle for me. Uh, you know, I, I had, I had a great early on trajectory. Um, but then once I started getting to the brown and black belt level, you know, training with blue belts and just training with my students here in Oklahoma, you know, it was hard to go into these major events and, uh, and overcome, you know, that yeah. level uh, in the head. And, yeah. and also, you know, they, they kind of go together, right? The, when you get confidence in your technique, that gives you more direction. Okay. This is my technique instead of, trying this, trying that, trying this, trying that, you know? Um, so it made, made my mind stronger and then made my technique better. Um, and knowing, okay, I'm with, you know, I'm with, I'm, I'm with Salo, who's one of the greatest ever to do it at that time. And then are arguably the greatest. And then Shanji, who is now coming up and making his name. And he was like, Shanji was like two, three years ahead of me um, as a black belt. And I come in and, um, and, you know, I'm with them um, in this season of 2004, where Shanji becomes double, 
double gold champion at the Brazilian Nationals. And then he wins his first world title. He has a crazy match with Jacques A that year in 2004 in the absolute. Mm-hmm. He nearly won. Um, and uh, and now immediately Shanji is top three in the world. And um, and I was right there with them. And so I'm like, man, I'm doing all of this with them. They're the best. And I, I'm doing everything they're doing. And I'm starting to hold my own. You know, why not me? You know, and one thing that I like to talk about is how Solo helped me re reshape, you know, like re um, reframe my upbringing. Whereas like uh, I used to kind of use it as an excuse. Well, if I don't win, you know, it's I, I'm just from Oklahoma. I don't have all the training these guys do, blah, 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 you know, and I'm not supposed to win, you know. And then he helped me reshape it into like, okay, that's not why I'm going to lose. That's why I'm going to win because I work that much harder. I sacrifice that much more. I do travel. I want it more. I'm doing more to be here. And why not me? You know, it's my time. Let let me break through and, um, and, you know, show you that like it's possible. Right. And, um, and then I, I, I really found myself in it, and it all it all started coming together. Saulo, his public voice isn't very high. Like it's the, it, it, he doesn't really kind of like put himself out there in regards to who he is and what he does. He, he does very, very few interviews. Yeah. Why do you why do you think that is? Um, well, these days he's he's on a different path, um, you know he's um he's moved back to brazil he's with family he's a lawyer uh, yeah he actually uh man he solo is uh he's something else he puts his mind to something and he he gets it done and uh he when he moved back to brazil he committed himself to completing um his uh path to becoming a lawyer um he was in law school when he dropped out and focused 100 percent on jiu-jitsu um, and so he goes right back, right, right back in, you know, 20 plus years later or whatever, and, um, uh, uh, studies super hard and boom, pass the bar on the first try, um, in, in, in Brazil. And now he's full on, uh, working as a lawyer. Um, you know, I, I like he, he, I think a lot of it too, is like, he gave everything, you know, and, um, you know, that the book that he wrote, uh, University of Jiu-Jitsu or Jiu-Jitsu University, um, it, it for me, it's still the most powerful, like it's specifically to Jiu-Jitsu. It's like the Bible, <laughs> you know, um, and, and you can dive back into that thing today, uh, you know, nearly 20 years after he wrote it. And you're going to still find so many gems, so many like, whoa, that's powerful. I mean, he, he's still, his teachings still have that effect on me today. You know, I, I, a lot of his mastery, you know, it takes so long for you to really fully appreciate the level that he is on. You have to obtain your own sense of mastery to be able to understand his mastery, you know, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, he gave everything to Shanji. He, he gave everything to me and those that were around him at that time. He wrote his book. He built something special. And to be quite honest, when the pandemic hit and everything, you know, I think he just said, you know what, this is a time for me to take a different path. Time and yeah, yeah, he went back home to his family and uh, and it was time for, for Shanji to, you know, kind of step up to to the, the leadership role. So, so you and Salo had this classic match in 2003, which obviously created an incredible bond between the two of you. And shortly thereafter, you got to see Jeff Monson and Patapano. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was like two well, matches that was later. Next, that was uh, 2004. That was, was the it 2004. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But you got, you got quite a, yeah. quite a good. Yeah. I was you there. A lot. I was there nice. for both of those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did, were yeah. you there in 2004? I was, I was, I was when the melee happened um you know fun times <laughs> it was like jeff running around in his jack strap ripping down wires yeah uh, it was helio seneca punching him yeah. it was phenomenal it's phenomenal yeah. 
Seneca lost lost it. It was uh, I mean, they, everyone lost it, but it was it was crazy seeing Seneca so little trying to go after Munson, who's so big, you know. When we interviewed Munson, we asked him, "So, what? Did you ever talk to Helio Seneca?" He's like, "Yeah, who cares? Like, it didn't bother him at all." He's like, "Yeah, the guy punched me. Who cares?" <laughs> What's funny is Munson is such a laid back, like he, he's kind of a teddy bear uh, deep down. I mean, he's really a nice guy. Um, you know, I, I like when you travel to these events, you know, you end up hanging out with people and especially, um, when you go solo, like there are a lot of things that I went to just by myself, he's there by himself. And then you just kind of, you know, Hey man, uh, here you are, here I am like, want to be friends. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, interesting guy. He was also, I had mutual friends with like, uh, on the, on the mat crew on the mad.com and he was close to them so they kind of you know we all the scotty yeah, scotty yeah, scott scotty another, another, another pioneer yeah yeah 100 percent um and uh and that's how it happened that's how i became really good friends with like uh jeff glover and bill cooper back in the days mike fowler you know just you're when you're the only green goes around you know uh you just tend to tend to support each other um, nowadays, you know, people don't remember the, people don't know what it was like back then, you know, um, like, uh, it's just, just a different time, different time. So you get your black belt in 2000, was it 2003? Uh, 2004, Four. August of 2004. Yeah. You boot the 2005 Budo challenge, Hicks and Gracie's the promoter, Kid Peligro, it's invite only. You got to go through Kid Peligro to even get a spot. Like that was, you obviously earned yours. That was a pretty important moment in a black belt's life where two of the biggest people in the sport, Kip Deligro writing for ADCC, Hickson is Hickson. And your name is one of the four people chosen to be in that tournament. Mm -hmm. What did that mean to you? Um, man, that was uh, definitely like a coming out moment for me. Um, uh, first, it was a, an amazing event. Um, definitely one of my all time favorite events that I've ever done. Uh, Hickson had a real, um, kind of specific rule set that had never been done. There still hasn't really been anything quite like that. Um, and you know, it's Hickson, you know, so it's like, you know, uh, like just whatever you can do to, to kind of absorb some of his energy and just, you know, I mean, if you can get him to talk to you, it's like, oh, that's that's a great day, right? You know, um, uh, but of course, Solo had spent a, a substantial amount of time with Hickson, and he credits Hickson um, greatly for his evolution um, and said it changed him. He went there to stay with Hickson two weeks, and I think he stayed for like six months, something like that. Um, oh. It was something crazy like that. Um, but uh, uh, you know, Shanji got got in and then uh uh you know i i won the pan ams earlier that year um you know so i was already making waves as a black belt it was still like you know i'd only been a black belt a year and um and you know they're trying to take one from brazil us japan um and so it just made sense like you know for me to be in representing the us um uh, and I had to go up a weight class because Shanji was in the weight class that I would have done. And I got the opportunity. I'm like, well, well they were asking, would you do it? And I'm like, of course, of course, you know, hundred <laughs> percent. And, um, and that was it. And it just became a special night. Solo was the coach for me and Shanji. We both won. Um, and, uh, well, uh, let's, 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 let's not let, the, we're not going to let that slide. Your first opponent is, is, uh, Holes Gracie. Yes. Who, who, and like here, there's politics in jujitsu. There's politics everywhere. I'm thinking you're up a weight class. He's a gringo. They're probably thinking this is a buy in regards to the tournament. I, I, I think, I, I don't think they thought quite like that. I think people knew, you know, that I was uh, coming, you know, to hit a certain level. I don't think they thought it was an easy match by any means, but, um, you know, they were still probably confident <laughs> uh yeah. of course yeah as as we all are um and uh and yeah so that was um, a match i was able to win by submission it was crazy back and forth and that's where this big buzz uh started because 
you know, a gringo submitted a Gracie on that night. Oh yeah. Oh dude, your, your name was, I think being yelled in a profane manner and certain people <laughs> and other people was like, we finally got an American to represent, you know, the country in Jiu Jitsu. So you submit holes Gracie with a Bravo choke and then, uh, was it Takahishi Kosai, you win by DQ. You know, there was a very yeah. unique rule set, but you walk out of there with the cash prize. Yeah, I mean, he got DQ because he bit me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, really high-level judo guy. Um, and he did a great job breaking grips and kind of running away a little bit. And they were giving negatives if you pulled guard, similar to ADCC. Um, but then they gave positive points for submission attempts, not just advantages, but actual points. And the crazy thing about it was there was no screen showing what the score was. And the referee didn't hold up points. The referee just kept you in the center and, and just controlled the match. There were three judges and the judges on the outside, they kept their own tally of points. And, uh, and then they would, you know, turn in their cards at the end and determine um you know determine who is the winner you know best two out of three judges um and hickson said if you hold anything longer than like 10 seconds without attacking we're going to give you a negative you know and if hickson says that it's like okay so you didn't ever saw the points so you didn't know if there was you didn't know if you were winning if you were losing how many negatives they were giving whatever and every time you pull guard you had to go crazy because now you're already down and um, and every submission attempt was worth points, blah, 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 blah. But you never saw the score. And so, you know, oddly enough, I think there was only like maybe one match that went to decision, um, uh, which was actually Cameron Earl. Cameron Earl was a uh, 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 huge underdog against Marcelo Garcia, but he got a really tight footlock and uh, was able to score points with the near submission. And Marcelo, I think, swept him or passed his guard one time. Uh, but Marcelo never applied a submission and submissions were three points and positions were only one point. And, uh, and so Cameron Earl won, but then he got submitted by Shinya Aoki in the final. Um, so Aoki won that, that division. Um, but, you know, I think that match with, with Cameron and, and Marcelo was maybe one of the only ones that went to decision. Everything had submit. There was crazy amount of submissions because you were just like, man, I don't know what's going on. Just go, 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 go. And it was like two, four minute rounds, I think. Um, so it was very dynamic. You know, you went hard, had a little break, go back out there, go hard again. Anyways, um, I think it was the second round. I finally managed to reverse the judo guy, got on his back and I started to choke him. And he, we went down, ah, you know, and he, he bit my hand and there was, I, I mean, it hurt. And then there was big teeth marks and I'm like, <laughs> I, I show the ref. I'm like, dude, cause I'm on his back. I had him sprawled out, you know? So I'm, I'm like mounted on him on his back. And I'm like, dude, the guy's biting me, man. And the ref saw the teeth marks and he just stopped it right there. And then Hickson counted it as a submission. So they, they had a good pay plus submission bonuses. And I was on cloud nine. Like I made, I made good money that night. Um, you know, I'm only 22 uh 22 years old first big event as a black belt it was it was amazing yeah cloud nine for sure you had mentioned cameron cameron earl in june of 2005 in the black belt pro-am for third place you and cameron earl had a go as well yeah how, yeah. how was he as a competitor he was uh he was a tough guy man super super aggressive uh you know really quiet dude um, and he was, you know, from the Half Gracie team, they, they had a reputation of being kind of hard nosed submission hunters, you know, Dave Camarillo, uh, was from there. Um, they had a couple other really top competitors back in those days. And they were one of the few that would go anyone from Half Gracie, you know, they would go down to Brazil, uh, back in the days when I was going down to Brazil. And a lot of times some of Half's gringo students were able to reach the podium. Right. So I'm pretty sure Cameron meddled when he was a brown belt. I think he took third, third place in, at the Worlds. So did Dave Camarillo. You know, and back in these days, it was really, really difficult for a gringo to win a medal at the Worlds. Like 
blue, purple, brown, black. You took all the divisions. And at the end of the competition, maybe three or four or five non-Brazilians meddled in all the divisions combined, oh. you know? So there might be one or two blue belt medalists, maybe a purple belt medalist. If you got lucky that year, there was a brown or black belt medalist. Um, and then that equaled like five people, you know? So that's how hard it was for a gringo to get on the podium just in any, any belt level. And, uh, and so when they did it, everyone knew all the other gringos, you know, would talk about it be like, oh, did you hear so-and-so, the blue belt from Half Gracie? He took third place or he took second place. You know, Carlos Machado, he had a couple of guys that uh, would do good down there, like especially like Travis Luter. Travis Luter medaled as a blue belt, as a purple belt. Savage, savage. Yeah, super tough guy back in those days. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I was a part of that crew. Um, even before that, the Machado team in L.A., the Inouye brothers, they would uh, – uh, oh. they, they did really well. Rico Rodriguez, you know, these were the – you know – no, nowadays, no one even knows. Dude, they're pioneers. Dude, they're pioneers, man. And, and let, let me kind of circle back before we get too off, of course. For those of you guys at home, Cameron Earl, he's got two or three wins over Marcelo Garcia. Like, he had Marcelo's number. Yeah. And he's doing life in prison right now. And we've, like, had, like, roommates of his on talking about their MMA careers. All of them have said he's, like, the scariest individual they've ever met. Like, period. Did, did he kind of yeah. strike you that way as well? He was just really quiet and um, I don't know, maybe like, so we hung out the night after the Budo challenge um, and he was icing his foot. Um, so, cause Gumby, Gumby was there and Gumby is another half, you know, Scotty and Gumby from on the mat, they're half Gracie guys. And, um, and I don't know, to me, Cameron, he was always nice. I don't know if maybe it was cause I beat him earlier that year or what, but um, he was a he was a decent enough guy to me, but I could definitely see that this guy he might have a temper. Um, you know, it, yeah, he had that he had that uh, that look about him. But um, you know, I, I I've always been cool. Like that's another thing that's different about jujitsu nowadays. Like back in back in in my time coming up, it wasn't a big deal. You know, okay, we you know we show up at the tournament. Maybe we don't really say much to each other. We fight our asses off. And then, you know, when it's over at the end of the night, like it wasn't a big deal for us to say, hey, man, you know, uh, great match. You know what I mean? Like, like, good job. You beat me or you or you didn't beat me. It was just like, you know, there was more, I think, a little more respect. And, and it wasn't, you know, we not everyone. The tournament didn't end. And then everyone just looked down at their phone and, and, and do their 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 post. You know what I mean? The tournament would end. And we would just be in the same hotel or in this whatever place that the, you know, we're all at. And, uh, and we would just talk, you know, we just start talking and, uh, you know, I, like, and it wasn't a big deal. We can be friends and still want to, you know, beat each other, um, you know, from different teams and we fight, we, you know, we compete, we, we, we go, you know, all in, but, uh, but then afterwards, you know, especially at ADCCs and stuff like that. It was like, man, let's have a beer. Let's, let's have a drink and just talk. And man, we had, there was some epic, <laughs> epic ADCC after parties back in the days, you know, especially when we're in some random country where we don't know anybody. And, uh, and, and it's not like we all could just, oh, I have friends. Let's go there. You know, we, we didn't separate. Everyone stayed together and we all went to the same place and we'd all, you know, party. The hotel party. lobby. That hotel yeah. lobby is the best after party. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good times. For sure. Speaking of uh, kind of highly competitive opponents, you've also went to battle with Herbert Santos before. What is your mindset going in? One, he is a top tier talent guy, but you've always got that X factor whenever you compete against somebody like him. Yeah. yeah so that was just last year. Um, yeah. So there is a whole, a whole like, um, you know, kind of journey, uh, you know, where from 2020, you know, January, um, I was supposed to be defending my title in a rematch for Bellator. And instead of it being me fighting um, and trying to hold on to that belt for as long as possible, you know, I had to relinquish my title because of a medical condition. And 
you know, I, I, I kind of was in this deep depression and, and just figuring out what's next. And then the pandemic hits and all of this, you know, and I, I had really kind of come to find myself as an MMA fighter. Um, it became a true love and passion of mine. I didn't really enjoy it too much in the beginning. I enjoyed the challenge. Um, but did I have a great time preparing for an MMA fight? Nah, I wouldn't say that. Um, but then as I kept going, uh, it started to become, it started to become very fun. And I, I tell people this and it probably surprises them, but I truly believe that MMA is what I was best at is what I am best at. Um, I feel like I'm a better, a better martial artist when I can put it all together versus when I'm just doing jujitsu gi or no gi or something like that. Um, I think all my skills, my upbringing come out in the best way possible um, in MMA, you know, because it represents everything that I've trained in my whole life. And, uh, and so I felt like I was just becoming like my black belt version of myself, like winning that fight would be almost like getting your black belt, you know, on the podium after becoming like a brown belt world champion or something like that. You know, it's like I, I graduated in that fight and I did receive my Muay Thai and MMA black belt after that from my my head coach my uh, my muay thai master who's who's under the shoebox lineage of Rafael cordero and so i feel like oh man now i'm hitting a new level i have all of these skills i'm going to show i'm just going to be that much better and then boom i can't do it anymore and i can't you know i can't show the rest of my work you know and now i have to circle back and i'm like oh do i just quit you know do i just retire completely but I had, I, I didn't feel, I was uneasy, you know, it's like, I'm still in this amazing shape, right? I'm just a world champion uh, in MMA and, and I love having a challenge. And so I'm like, all right, let me put the gi back on and, and just go in back into jujitsu during a pandemic and all these other stresses and just whatever. And well, uh, let, let me interject with Herbert, you might be entering an MMA match. You just weren't aware of it when you signed the contract. No, that's true. That's true. I made a I made a joke that I got kicked more times in that jujitsu match than I ever did in any in any MMA fight. Um, but you know that was a couple of years later. So from 2020 going into the worlds last year in 2022, I had um, you know this little mini journey of coming back to the gi and trying to build myself up to you know top world level caliber again after you know six years uh or a little more fully focused on mma as my number one priority and um and then of course now i'm like nearly 40 years old doing gi going against 20 year olds um you know and uh there were some ups and downs but i, I found my stride and uh, i was able to to get some good wins you know i won the europeans last year uh, one of the oldest guys to ever win a major IBJJF title, um, you know, in the adult division. And, uh, and then, I, you know, going to the Worlds, I, I had good confidence and I was able to beat Herberth, who was a 2017 world champion, and I was a 2007 world champion. So a 10 year difference. But, um, but you know, I like to talk about timeless jiu-jitsu and, and the technique that I really believe that lasts you know, it transcends generations and, um, and, you know, people tend to call it like the fundamentals or the basics and they, they put it in this box. It's like, Oh, that's what you learn as a white belt, but then you don't have to go back to it. And you just, now it's like, you know, all these other more advanced fancy techniques that, uh, that they put their energy into and they kind of maybe forget about some of those white belt techniques. Um, and I'm, I'm really well known as someone that applies those basic techniques at, at a high level and um and that's what helped me stay successful and stay at the top this long and that's what helped me win that match all right so you talk about basics that's a really good segue 2006 pan ams you're one and done in a normal tournament with eduardo tellez you lost by points you enter the absolute tellez is your first opponent and then probably second, at the second opponent Second opponent, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you, and then you, you wind up with somebody that's probably at the peak of their career, mastering basics, Hodger Gracie. Yeah, I ran into Hodger two times. That time at the yeah. Pan Am, and then another time at the World Championships, 
Um, you know, he was one of those, like, obviously, Shanji w- had a rivalry with him. And uh, we knew that was going on. You know, they, they, we knew that was the – he was the focus. It's like, in order for Shanji to be the absolute best, you know, the absolute champion, we knew that he would have to get through Hajar. And, of course, my goal was to not, you know, to not make Shanji have to do that and for me to take him out so we could close it out and, you know, make things a little easier for Shanji. But, uh, but we were very aware, I, you know, believe it or not, funny story, first time I trained with Hajar was 1999. I was 16 and he was 18 uh, because Carlos Machado was, uh, was from Gracie Baja. Carlos was actually one of the, the main instructors of a lot of the OG legends that came out of Gracie Baja, he was teaching them when they were like blue belts and purple belts. And so my first years going to Brazil, I was training at Gracie Baja before I met Salo. And uh, Hajar and I had a role. And uh, it was funny because there was no clock. I don't know if he would remember this. We, we've talked about it before, but we didn't get too specific. But there was no clock. They were like, oh, you guys are around the same age. You should roll together. And uh, I think we, we probably went for like around 20 minutes. Um, and then, uh, obviously I knew who he was. And then every year I'd end up training with him cause we're on the same size. And he, every year he got further and further ahead of me. Um, he was a little older than me, you know, um, uh, as well. He's like two years older than me. So physically that was helping him a little bit, um, when we were training and he got ahead on the belts too. We were purple belts at the same time, I believe. And then, um, uh, by the time we got to Brown, he was only a Brown belt one year, went to black and then, you know, became, you know, Hodger, uh, the goat. And, uh, oh, but yeah, we always had so much love and appreciation for his style, you know, very much the same style that Salo had Shanji as well. Uh, you know, we're mounters. We, we love to finish from the mount. And so when he was, when he finished me like that, it wasn't a surprise, you know, I know I already knew what that felt like. And I knew that that was my goal as well. I was on search in search of that same level of mastery. Um, I believe technical mastery, it's you circle back to those sound fundamentals, right? And, and you want to make it as easy as possible, you know? Um, and that's going to come with the basic techniques and mastering those. Although, they, you know, you put the word basic with them, the, to master those techniques takes an extreme amount of dedication and time and practice. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I'm one of the lucky ones that gets to say that they've been cross choked by Hajar, uh, <laughs> but we're, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're like friends, I would say, you know, we message each other from time to time and I, I've trained with him several times in London um when I visited there and uh he's always made his academy a, a second home for me when I when I'm in London um he's uh you know just an amazing amazing technician and someone I respect a lot speaking of getting choked by the Gracies you were actually featured two times in the Gracie the next generation promotional video your matches with Henner both of your matches with mm. Henner I've never even seen this video <laughs> yeah it was like a little thing that was floating around uh, i used to drive the bus for adcc uh-huh. so that's where like a lot of my information comes from i used yeah. to just kind of like listen and take notes and uh, yeah there was both of your matches with henner on there where you got choked out twice yeah yeah that was a rough year 2002 um you know that's going back to what i was talking about earlier becoming a brown belt um i really had uh i had some hardships um i uh yeah, like I was going to college. I wasn't happy. I was very, very depressed. Uh, I didn't like college. Um, and I, I really didn't want to go. And, uh, you know, I did really well in high school. I was nearly val- valedictorian of my class. I was in the top 10, like did really, really good. And then as soon as it was over, you know, I had different scholarships and stuff for, you know, academics because jujitsu wasn't as oh, right. obviously. Um and yeah, as soon as I got out, it was just like, you know, the, the next year I got my brown belt and I was like, man, this, this now needs 100% dedication and, uh, and I can't give it because I'm going to school. Um, and 
yeah, 2002, I went, I went 50, 50. So the same amount of matches that I won, I lost. And, um, that was one of the toughest years of my career. I, I, I really like, um, uh, struggled to process and like, man, okay, I'm, I, I want to have these goals. It's like, am I going to get there? Am I not going to get there? I really started doubting and questioning myself and believe it or not, my father was not supportive of me becoming a full-time martial artist. Um, really? Wanted, yeah. He wanted me to, um, you know, go to school, do, get a degree, become a professional of some sort and work a regular nine to five and not have to go through what he was going through, you know, because there was no real business uh back in these days you know for for mixed martial arts and jujitsu you know um everything was karate taekwondo um mma was looked upon as like a barbaric like you know um like just thug kind of violent sport and um and so you know business was tough um several years that he was operating our, our school you know, we, we spent more than what we made, you know what I mean? And, uh, so he didn't want me to go that route, uh, finan a financial hardship and all that. So he was really heavy on me going to college. And then the next year, 2003 is when I competed against solo. And, um, I, I got the opportunity from solo to go to Brazil and train with him and his brother um and just just the opportunity any opportunity from him to be around him and his words like he came into the seminar here and um and spent the whole week with us and he made a big impact on my father um obviously a big impact on me and he really opened himself like just he he gave so much for nothing he asked nothing um you know he trained with he came for a whole week to do a one-day seminar and trained with me every day and wow. never charged never charged for a private lesson, nothing, and trained with me every day and helped me. And he said, look, I know you've been on your own. Um, come, go, go to Brazil, train with my brother every day, be a part of our team. We'll coach you at every event. You'll go to everything with us and you get ready with us and, and you do it. You know, why are you in school? Do you want to, you, do you want to do that? Like do you it's, want such, to, it's such the opposite advice yeah. that everybody is going to tell you to get. Yeah. Okay. Well, he okay. was just like, look, you want to be a black belt world champion? I say, yes. He's like, then why are you going to school? Go all in. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. You're right. And so uh, after he left, literally like a week later, I set my parents down and I, I had the conversation with them. I tell them about what my, what, what Salo said to me about this invitation and everything. And, and uh you know, I just poured my heart out. I told my dad, look, you know, uh, what'd you expect? You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm following yeah, you your raised, footsteps. he raised you. Yeah. yeah he raised I'm, you. I'm, it's his fault. <laughs> right. I'm living, I'm, 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 I'm ready to live my passion the same way you showed me. Um, you know, keep in mind too, my father is a professional organist. So he's lived his passion his whole life. When I was a kid in Cincinnati, he was a professional organist living as a musician. And then we go to move to Oklahoma and he starts a martial arts school. Now he's living his other passion, you know? So he's always been outside the box, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, you know, I'm just, I, I can't look back and, and wonder what if I have to do this, I have to go all in. And he's like, after resisting, 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 um, he, uh, he said, okay, I get it. I understand. Um, he made me promise that I would go back to school one day. I still haven't done that yet. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but everything worked out, you know? And so I dropped out of college. Um, I ran up a credit card. I got into a lot of credit card debt and I moved to Brazil. Uh, literally like a month later, I moved to Brazil. All right. So in the, in all of that, you had mentioned your father's not even making money at his gym. What kind of sacrifice did he sacrifice? Did he make in order to ensure that you had the best opportunities? Man, an insane, insane amount. Um, you know, it came a point where in the beginning, you know, I was really young. My dad was doing all the traveling. Um, number one, he doesn't like to fly. So, I mean, he like never flies. Uh, it, it takes a lot to get him to fly. So he was driving all the way to California. And then when 
Carlos uh, became available in Dallas. He was driving to Dallas all the time. And, um, you know, but then the school, you know, is growing. And because of those financial hardships, he's like, okay, I need to focus more on business. And then, um, you know, it, it came to a point where he had to stay home to work. And then I'm like 15, you know, and it's like, okay, it's easier to send me to places to do things. And then I would come back home and show him what I learned. And, um, and then we would just like drill and go over all my notes. And, um, you know, we kind of switched roles a little bit, but we were always working together, you know? Um, and, and by then, like when I'm 14, you know, I'm like already the same size as my dad, if not bigger, by the time I'm 15, 16, I'm way bigger than my dad. So, uh, you know, it was, we were like training partners since I was a very young age because I was such a big kid and he, and he was a smaller guy. He was only like 145 pounds back then. Um, so, you know, size wise, it just, it worked. And plus he was my dad, you know? Um, but, um, anyways, he invested, he started investing in me heavily. So, you know, 1999 was the first year I went to Brazil and he would like, he created a fundraiser, you know, at the school, um, you know, we would go around oh, and try, wow. try to get, we would try to get sponsors at different local businesses and just raise money. And, you know, I would like do free classes and all these things to try to just bring people in. Um, and, you know, we'd try to get in the newspaper, let people know like all these things, um, to raise money so I could go to Brazil. And, um, and that's really how it was, you know, it's like, he can only put everything into one of us, you know, and he, and it, it became me. Um, and, uh, and so actually to this day, my dad's never even been to Brazil. A lot of that is because he doesn't like to fly, but also, you know, earlier on, it was also just because only, only one person could get there. You know, we only had enough for one. And, yeah. uh, and then whenever I got to this age and I drop out of college and everything, and, you know, now I don't have, uh, student loans or anything to, to live off of. And so I'm just running up a credit card, traveling the world, um, <laughs> to, to learn and compete, you know, and, and of course there's extra pressure. Cause it's like everything that my family put into me and now it's like, okay, it's time. You got to make it, you know, but that's how it has to be. You got to go all in, you know, you got to cut the, cut the rope and, and go, you know, and, uh, and believe. And, um, you know, that was one of those hard years that led to me going all in and in the end of the day everything worked out all right so you talked about pressures and, hey, and, and mike hard. yeah sorry to interrupt um so i'm gonna have to cut this here in, a, in the next few minutes uh to, sorry to cut it short but i had another thing going on at four dude and do your thing do you think would you mind if we pick up next week right around this time yeah yeah, actually, cool. that'd be perfect. We can do that. Uh, next week will be tough. I'm going on vacation for my 40th birthday, um, but uh, but 100, we can we can pick this up again. 100. I got my notes here, dude. I, I got there's some really cool stuff that took place in your career that I guarantee you haven't talked about. I'd like to hit that. So I'll be in touch with Definitely. you. I shoot you a text. We'll figure it out. All right, brother. Okay, sounds Thanks good. Up, yeah. Thank Thanks, you, Mike. Bro. Take yeah. care, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes our episode with Rafael Lovato. I want to introduce everybody to some to somebody. Jay Mather, Jay, uh, Draculino student out of Texas. I can't tell you how much this guy helps me out, especially in the jujitsu side. Um, MMA, I'm an absolute encyclopedia. Mental illness run wild. Jujitsu, I have some basic questions or understanding that I might need kind of clearing up. This guy right here is my clutch. Jay, what do you think of the episode? I thought it was really good. Um, you did a good job as usual. Uh, Lovato Jr. is easily one of the best American grapplers that we have, uh, especially in Gi. He's one of five American males to ever win it. And he's a two-sport athlete. And uh, I don't think what you champion. got from his MMA side yet, huh? Yeah, so. two-sport champion. Well, you know, Jay, here's the thing. I send out lots of messages. And when I got somebody that bites, like a Lovato, Gabby Garcia coming up, I reel them in as fast as possible. So I kind of like put the people that are in queue 
I, I'm not going to say bump them, but sometimes I'll, I'll get like a, a little buffer of a day or two and I'll need more than just myself looking at somebody's record, especially like Lovato. When I first threw his name at you, you were like, fuck yeah, dude. Hell yeah. And then I texted you, did you look at his record? And like right away, because I mean, you know, you know, the show, you were like, oh, this is problematic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's way too much here. Mm -hmm. So we broke it down to 2007, um, caught him in between 4th of July, right before 4th of July. And his birthday was right there as well. So I got an hour out of him. This thing's going to air. Hopefully I get him for another two hours, seven, eight, nine, ten mm -hmm. more times. Because, um, you know, when we got him off his, his, out of his comfortable track that those guys like to run, it, it, it shit got real interesting, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he's got a lot of uh, a lot of great stories. And he's competed against the best the grapplers. Uh, jiu -jitsu, like, in a gi, no gi, best grapplers in jiu-jitsu. Like, some of them the best ever. Like, Adolfo Vieira, Hodger Gracie, Cyborg, you know, it's, it's crazy. Bernardo Fari, I could go on and on. Yeah. And um, so we got him for an hour. And I, I, I think kind of like when he understood what we were doing, he slowed down. But like, it, it's just legend after legend after legend after legend. And I, I tell you that one regret that I have about the interview is uh, hiring Gracie. We didn't we didn't get to it yet. So in essence, um, Mark Lehman, hiring Gracie. They're going to go at it. Hiring Gracie brings in Javier Vasquez. We talked about this in our Javier Vasquez interview. And um, Mark Lehman moves in Lovato into his studio. So they're not just like training at the gym. They're living together. And it, this is before there was any real money in the sport outside of ADCC. And this is pretty much like sponsors and people that believed in their athlete Pony up, ponying up the cash in order to make a match like that happen. And it's just, it's absolutely legendary. And our next interview with Lovato, hopefully we get it one day. I'm opening with that. I'm opening with that. We're going to complete the 2007 run because we just kind of touched on it. We didn't really get through it because it's, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a legendary year, no matter like who you're talking about. Like there's very few athletes in the world that can compare their one year to the 2007 that Lovato Jr. had. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, yeah, and, you know, what, what Mike's referring to is Lovato. I think he's the first black belt ever to win IBJJF Grand Slam. So to do that, you have to win Worlds, Brazilian Nationals, Pan Americans, and the European Open, which is extremely hard to do. Like, a lot of people can't even – afford the plane tickets let alone go there and compete against you know extremely good talent at every tournament and he did it i think he was the first person to ever do it let alone american um he's that year he's the first american to win brazilian nationals these are all gi tournaments by the way and I, i've heard people say that they think that brazilian nationals is even harder than worlds in america because a lot of those guys can't get visas or it's difficult for them and you know brazil is like the mecca of gi jitsu oh yeah america yeah like i said earlier uh, only five american men have from america have won black belt adult worlds and he was one of them and, all right uh, yeah. All right, so so I'm going to tell you another thing that we fell short on. I mean, it's a phenomenal listen, but it's a good introduction. Kind of like the beginning of his black belt competition, which is where we're at. Um, if we had a second hour, I was going with Gracie. And, like, if you look at where he trained, I kind of touched on it a little bit. He trained everywhere and didn't, like – it didn't matter to him. I, I'm not going to say loyalty is a lack of loyalty because that, that, that's not true, but his ability to go to other gyms, be accepted by those gyms and have his coaches, you know, Silo and Zande 
accept the fact that, that he's leaving their system to kind of maybe just dabble somewhere else without any repercussions. The only other person that did that was Eric Paulson, like at a high level. And Eric Paulson got blackballed. He got thrown out of the Gracie Torrance Academy. Like they're really like the same path, like including like their like uh, Lovato Senior. They had some of these same instructors as Eric Paulson. And the one question I wanted, the one thing I wanted to do, I kind of wanted to bring his trajectory in regards to where he trained. I got it all mapped out, like it's freaking mentally ill map with with lines to it. <laughs> And I got Paulson's like that. And I wanted to say the dirty dozen, you know, the first uh -huh. the black belts, Eric Paulson's name should be in that. But because of politics, it wasn't. Eric Paulson was taken, was taken, um, he, he was taken privates with Hoyce and and uh Hickson in like 90, like 89. Like 86, 87, 86 and 87, 1986, 1987, before UFC won was it was a little less than 10 years away. Mm -hmm. That's Eric Paulson. And what I kind of want to do is not, not apply pressure, just why don't we give him a little love? You know, mm -hmm. why why don't you dealt with adversity? He has never really gotten his shine because of adversity that, you know, maybe some things that politically he may or may not have done properly. But Eric Paulson, that's a dirty dozen member. He's just, there should be an asterisk on that. Just my personal opinion. Yeah. And I know that I, I was it a problem with him the way it was with Chris? Cause I know Chris Brennan, uh, Professor Chris, all these guys are professors. <laughs> uh, yeah. They all, yeah. a, a bunch of them wanted, to fight and if they were training at Torrance um that could be an issue because they had a bunch of guys you know it was a feeder for not only Hoyce um Hickson but other guys they had coming out of Brazil so yeah there was a little protectionism I'd say but I'm sure well, it, 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 they were still establishing their brand though yeah right? that's what I think and so there's a little fairness to it as well and I know, it, you know, in terms of marketing, it's just, it's unfortunate. These people came at that time and, and the Gracie family, they had the wear, foresight and the wherewithal to understand, wait a minute, dude, you know, that guy's not Brazilian and it's kind of Brazilian jujitsu. So people don't just call it, oh, it's jujitsu from Japan or catch wrestling or something like they, they had like that, that name brand dialed in there. and they, they weren't playing with it. So I, I also get it. Like, I yeah, can't sit I, here and go, or Paulson, the Gracie's bad, bad. No, I also understand their position. 100%. And who's to say that these guys don't regret any of the decisions that they've made? But also, I mean, they've more than earned it with the amount of time, blood, sweat, and tears that, that the Gracie's have put in, you know what I mean? Okay. I mean Torian did start the UFC. That's why everyone wanted to learn jiu-jitsu. That yeah. was the best marketing for jiu-jitsu probably ever. Yeah. Yeah. That and Joe Rogan. And yeah, I mean, that those were huge. Yeah. The Gracie family. I guess. Dude, I, listen, you hear the interviews. Every once in a while, I'll throw a pot shot at Hickson. And like, even in like Robert Drysdale's book, he even says a lot of people kind of roll their eyes at the Hickson like myth and legend and accolades. Those are out of Robert Drysdale's book, not my mouth. And uh, you know, but the, but the end of the day, like my jujitsu heroes all say he's the best. So yeah, then that's it. That's it. You know, it's like we, where my frustration is like in my some of my little comments is. Yeah, I just wish you had done an ADCC. I wish you would have, you know, fought some of the bigger names, you know, and 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 that's just that's just me being a fight fan. And it's it's nothing in regards to being personal. I, I need my dog Gracie. I mean, that's that's where I'm at with the Gracie family. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think that would have been nice too, but also like I think he was in his 30s by the time, like he was a little older. He was a little older. He had been he was a little older, yeah, and he had been fighting since he was like a kid in Brazil doing like, you know, 
basically Gracie challenge fights and training jiu-jitsu every day. And so I think that was a big part of it. Also, you know, his son Hoxson died and apparently that was just absolutely yeah. devastating for Hickson and rightfully so. Like I heard yeah. he, he went back to Brazil and wanted to spend time with family and stuff. So, I mean, I think that's pretty understandable. It, 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 if, if you watch uh, the, you know, the Hickson documentary, he's also got uh. crippling. He, but he's also got crippling anxiety. Like mm-hmm. he 100% has anxiety in regards to fighting. And obviously he does it. He's done it more than, you know, most people ever will. And, but, but he did, he had anxiety in regards to it, you know, and, and, and that's, that's okay. You're, you're supposed to. Um, I know there was also in Kron's last uh, fight. I know it was his first fight since coming back from, um, hearing that his father had dementia but i also hear that they don't see each other often So there's two people in all of our interviews, like whenever I do a, a, the research, like y- you're a huge help with that. But like when I'm calling my other contacts in jujitsu, um, there's two people that the repeated thing was, yeah, he hasn't been in the gym in months, comes here and submits the entire gym. Oh, and by the way, that entire gym had this person, this person, this person, all winning ADCC that year. And it's Hicks and Gracie and Liborio. And, yes. And, yes. And Liborio, like, and the common thing that they say is, well, I was a black belt, you know, 180cc. I rolled with the guy a few times on the same day, and I left confused, thinking maybe I should quit and hang it up. There's only two athletes that, that, that bear, like, distinction of having world-class athletes say that, and that's Liborio and Hickson. And the difference between the two is – I shouldn't say the difference. One of the main things that I, that I, I see in the difference between the two is one, I'm a Carlson Gracie guy, senior man. I I would join that guy's cult. Like he is somebody I admire as a human being. Never mind what he did in jujitsu. I know he was, you know, always kicking shit off and talking shit, but he did it for the betterment of the sport. And Carlson used to always say, Leborio will beat him. Leborio will beat him. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, but that, that's, that's what you do. You want to build a fight, you know? So, but this is about Lovato. Come on. Dude. Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's so much to know. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you know, it's just, it's like little things like these little peaks and stuff like that allow us into, um, kind of really getting to know somebody. And, um, no, I enjoyed it. And, and you really helped me out with it, Jay. I sincerely appreciate, um, being able to kind of bounce ideas off of you. No, I love doing it. You know, it's, it's fun. It's enjoyable. It's interesting, you know, and it's, it's too much work for only one person to do. I feel Dude. like there's two, two people. It really is, man. Like I there's a few guys that I kind of lean on. Um, you know, I have you watching fights, looking for corner men, you know, while I'm like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. researching too. Like if I'm really kind of like, you know, crunching and calling my contacts, I'm like, Hey Jay, Look at a cornerman. Was this person in this fight? This person in that fight? It's just, it's part of it, man. You know, it's, it's it I think us- that's good. I think that's a good idea, though. I think those are some of the more interesting questions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cornering somebody. Do we, so we got Tim Cruder um, as well. I think it's going to air before this one. Tim oh, Cruder. you got Crater? We got Crater. I apologize. Crater. No, it's all good. That's great. Yeah. Tim Crater and he, um, was cornering Dustin Poirier for the majority of his career. So we got, mm. we, we slipped in a couple of those, but also, you know, concentrated on that himself. So it, it's a really mm-hmm. solid interview as well. But Jay, like, share, subscribe. It's the only way we're going to grow. And if you like stuff like this, 
We've got a bunch. We got Lee Borio. We, we've got uh, Pedro Sauer. We got Conan Silvera. We got a bunch of jujitsu guys already. Marco Soares. I mean, it's uh, Francisco Bueno. We got a bunch of guys. I mean, Pedro Hizo. We got him. Mm-hmm. He's not a jujitsu guy, but uh, Babalu. We, we got a ton of Brazilians. If you're into Brazilians and, um, you know, even though Lovato is not a Brazilian, I think by by proxy and elimination, they're kind of taking him on their team. Yeah, 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 <laughs> for sure. He's he's in with everybody, I guess. Yeah, he's accomplished yeah. so much. Who wouldn't? <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna put him over on their team, even though he's representing the United States. But, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please like, share, subscribe, comments in YouTube. If you guys can leave a review on. Um, on iTunes, and if you guys want a free T-shirt, as long as supplies last, help us out with the timestamps. We're always looking for timestamps. A guy named Ty Green has been slaying them for us. Um, I send him gift box after gift box from BKFC and you know anything that I can scrounge up. So if you guys are looking for free stuff, man, timestamps, get a hold of us through Instagram. Jay Mather, I'll be texting you, I'm sure, next week with some more from some more assignments for you. Let's go. (laughs) Be good, brother. Thank you, man. Yeah, you too. Take care. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.